All right. Welcome, Mr. Rick Manning. Hey, how are you guys? David, I've uh, been listening. It's, uh, you know, they, you're dead on. I mean, it's a, the, the Biden administration um, essentially manufactured this attack um, through the, their actions and through their, you know, saying, gee whiz, don't attack us, but you can attack Israel. I thought I'd never see. So I guess my question then is based on, I mean, so now you've got the Biden administration, which, you know, is is like you guys are saying, they're saying, hey, you know what, you, you can, you know, we're, we're not really going to get too involved in all of this. Um, where does this go now? I mean, what, what, it, what happens next? relative to this situation well, the israelis israelis apparently had planes in the air and were already on their way to striking iran uh and then biden called up uh, uh netanyahu and a 25 minute call and israel apparently called off the strike because the united states said we won't support you we you know despite the public statements that we have israel's back that biden basically told you now why would the israelis listen um it's 1,700 miles from Israel to Iran. You pass through airspace controlled by the United States and the United States Air Force. The Israelis are our allies. They don't want to have a tangle with us. They don't want to pass through our air, airspace without a permission or airspace we control without a permission. So they kind of do need our buy-in uh, to, to, to strike, but they just need us not to do anything. They just need us to get out of the way. Also, it's a long way. Israel may have to refuel, and they're probably going to need refueling tankers in the air and stuff like that. <clears throat> so the Israelis called it off, but I think the Israelis decided anyway they're going to go ahead with this. I think they've told the United States that they're going to go ahead with it. I think it's imminent. could be happening very soon. Yeah. I think it'll be a substantial strike, uh, and it'll be rather surprising. From what I'm seeing on the Israeli TV programs, their chattering class news programs, there's, a, there's an impatience in Israel. They're basically enough with all these fires. There's an arsonist in the region. They're setting fire after fire. We're paying a price. America's paying a price. Everybody's paying a price for all these fires Iran is setting everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's time to go after the arsonist. And, and so I think the Israelis are using the strategic mistake, I believe, of Iran to make it a direct confrontation to directly confront Iran back. And it's a, it's going to be a power a slugfest. But again, Iran is uh, is not that strong. I think that they expose themselves uh, on on on, sun, on Sunday morning and Saturday night. But the, the fact that they launched hundreds, 360 or so missiles or maybe launched as many as 700 and none did anything for real is a, it's an exposure of weakness. So I think the Israelis now with considerable confidence are entering the direct phase of the war with Iran. The big concern the Israelis have is still Hezbollah because they have a lot of missiles that will hit Israel. Uh, but it, that, that also I think is heading towards sort of a culmination soon. I, I guess what the, the, the other piece to this puzzle is, is, you know, what are the implications then for the United States if they continue essentially to do the same kind of shift that they did under Obama, and that is to align themselves with, with these radical entities? Rick, do you have a sense of what you think this looks like in, in Washington politics? Well, I, I think one of the telling things will be, you know, how much of what Israel is planning to do are they sharing with the United States? Given the relationship the U.S. has with Iran, you'd have to be an idiot to, to give them your operational plans in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So it is a, so in some respects, I think that's uh, going to tell a tale about what the, what the actual relationship is between the U.S. and Israel. What's more, um, you know, when we look at this moving ahead, um, the thing, there's a couple of things that are absolutely proven to be true. First of all, Ronald Reagan was right. 
and developing anti-ballistic missile systems. Everybody we in saw, the world should salute Ronald Reagan these days. You know, and he got mocked, he got ridiculed, it ended the Cold War, and now it's it kept Israel from being hit with an ICBM missile that could have had anything as a warhead. Okay, that's the, that's the reality. So we have a 40-year debt uh, and acknowledgement for Ronald Reagan's vision that allowed these this to ha- be stopped. Secondly, um, it is the, I, I think we've got a, they should be saying thank you to Donald Trump because the Abraham Accords that were put into place essentially recognized that the there was an Arab versus Persian conflict going on. And the Iranians, the Persians were taking, were trying to create hegemony in the region in their own caliphate which was in the direct opposite interests of the Arab Muslims. So we get into this whole Muslim against Judaism and Christianity, but the reality is the 30,000 year history in the region is the Persians and the Arabs don't like each other. And that's a, and, they, and they've not liked each other um, in a lot more intensity, they fought a lot more wars between them than there have been wars between Israel and their relative neighbors. So that's a, to me, you know, something people forget. And so what Trump did is by creating the Abraham Accords, he created the environment where Saudi Arabia could come to Israel's defense, where Jordan felt compelled to come to Israel's defense because their airspace was being violated, and and do so in a way that they could explain it, that this was an attack, this was the uh, attack that could have been directed at them. Right. And it's a, and so that no. mutual defense kind of atmosphere that created by the Trump administration came to fore and Joe Biden's not taking it taking credit for it, but the fact of the matter is he did everything he could to deconstruct that relationship through his Yeah, you know, Trump. Rick, I think you, you know, this is how America we we in America forget how powerful we are. And when you look at what Reagan did and what Trump did, they teed Israel up for success on every level whether it's the early uh, uh, memorandum that Kat Weinberger signed with the Israelis that led to the Arrow program. The Arrow was the long-range missile (laughs) yesterday used essentially in numbers for the first time to shoot down these ballistic missiles, the Israeli Arrow program. Mm -hmm. It was all part of missile defense, which, of course, Biden bitterly opposed as a senator in the 80s. Uh, Of course he did. Humiliated and ridiculed by everybody, uh, right. pie in the sky uh, type type stuff. And of course, that's what just saved us uh, from, a, from a horrible bloodletting last night or two nights ago. That's number one. Uh, two, the, the strategic architecture that Rick, Rich is, uh, Rick is saying here is critical. It, you know, Israel can do this strike partly because they have the alliance now of, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and UAE you know, if an Israeli plane is hit, they can crash into Saudi Arabia and they're fine, et cetera. So there's a or refuel over them, the security. But at the same time, a bad American policy that that goes against our allies is deadly for our allies. And that's the Obama administration, the Biden administration. We see Colombia, one of our best allies in Latin America, has fallen to a narco terrorist. Yeah. Uh, Brazil has fallen to a friend of a narco-terrorist communist. Uh, Chile has fallen. We're facing in our own hemisphere uh, communist narco-terrorist assault uh, coming because of uh, simply the very quick work done by the Biden administration to undercut uh, nations that were fighting China and Venezuela in that part of the world. Yeah, there, in the Middle East. We used to have this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. And yeah. uh, and we have pay- effectively told China um, there is no such thing as a Monroe Doctrine. We've told Iran there's no such thing as a Monroe Doctrine, and as a result, they have effect they have effectively created a narco terrorist entryway to Central America. That is the pathway being used to to basically import the military aged men into our country. We're not coming here because they want a job working at McDonald's. 
So that's a, you know, so yeah, it's been very dangerous. But I, David, I, I really would like for you to comment on Jordan because Jordan has been struggling a little bit. They, the, yeah. the internal situation in Jordan doesn't really bode well for Israel. But no. the last thing, I, the way I look at it, the last thing Jordan wants is for a powerful Hamas to emerge that takes over the West Bank area and, and effectively then becomes a threat to Jordan's government as they seek to expand I agree. into the weakness, and Amman. What happened was under the Obama administration, the playing footsie with Islamic terrorists and Islam and being weak against ISIS and all this Cairo speech, which was an attempt to appease Islamists and so forth, undercut our allies. And the front line of that was Jordan. So Jordan, I think a mistake, uh, Jordan uh, thought that it could ride the tiger and became pro-Palestinian, very, the, the, the essence of Jordan has always been cooperating with the Israelis to manage the Palestinian issue because 70% of Jordan is Palestinian. The other yeah. 30% are Bedouin Arab, they're the nomadic Arabs. Uh, and they've always been on good terms with Israel. In fact, Bedouins serve in Israel's army uh, in the south, in, in, in Israel. At any rate, Bedouin yeah. Arabs control the structure of governance in, in Jordan and they're threatened by the Palestinians. So. The government of Jordan and Israel have always worked together to maintain the stability of Jordan, which essentially buffers all the states of the region from each other. It's right like a big buffer zone in the middle of everything and keep the Palestinian issue within narrow bounds. Unfortunately, starting with Carter, I mean, starting with Clinton, uh, but really going forward with Obama, the Palestinian issue became such an obsession that it began to undermine Jordan. And Jordan felt nothing, that it couldn't do anything but try to appease the United States and appease the Palestinians, which is like riding the tiger, and the tiger will consume you. And it's gotten over the last few months to the point where the tiger was beginning to consume Jordan. And uh, Iran is threatening Jordan directly and saying, we are going to overthrow you because you're in the way of us getting to Israel. You're the ones who are stopping us from linking up with Hamas in the West Bank, and Judea and Samaria to attack Israel. So we're going to remove you. So Jordan now feels directly threatened by Iran, by Hamas. And when the missiles flew over Jordan last night, two nights ago, the Jordanians just felt they had no choice but to shoot it down. Sure. And I, and, and I, I think... I, uh, I, I think, think when you look at that map that Pastor Greg put up a few seconds ago, yeah. that you'll see how close Amman is to the West Bank to the Jordan River. And it's a it really, you know, the possibility, the probability of the spillover of um, revolutionary activity and land grab is pretty profound when it comes to uh, the, the Palestinian uh, radical terrorists in the West Bank and in Gaza um, kind of creating a power center in, in the West Bank that can look east as well as west um, to gain territory. Because exactly. remember, this is all called Transjordan in the original deal. And it, Israel yes. was separated yeah. out from Transjordan. So that's the, you know, so ultimately, yeah. Jordanian government, the biggest threat they face is an empowered Palestinian state. Always saw it that way. Case. King Hussein of Jordan, the father of the current king, saw it that way, cooperated profoundly with the Israelis strategically. By the way, the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel in 1995 has in it clauses that require strategic cooperation between the two countries. And Israel has been defending Jordan. It's been basically doing a lot of clandestine activity and some overt activity to prevent Iraqi militias Syrian militias from uh, uh, attacking Jordan. The famous one was in 1970, Black September, when the Palestinians rose up in Jordan and uh, tried to overthrow the king. Syria invaded Jordan from the north to try to help the Palestinians kill the king. And mm -hmm. the Israeli Air Force went on alert and started bombing the Syrians to stop them from invading Jordan. The, the uh, called the Black September event and, and uh, so forth. So this is a long-term relationship. But, the, the, the you, you know, Rick, you, ra you raised a key question. Imagine if Jordan fell. Hamas takes over the West Bank, which is what they're trying to do. You've got Tehran 
all the way from the border of Pakistan, reaching to within eight kilometers, ten mi- uh, uh, six miles of the Mediterranean Sea. Six miles. Um, one solid block of roughly 150 million people to 200 million people. That they also is control, the danger. They also would control a significant uh, stretch of the Saudi Arabian border, allowing them to launch multiple uh, attacks from all three sides, and from well, three sides of the Saudi Arabia. Using the tribes and everything. The borders don't mean anything. The border between Jordan and Saudi Arabia isn't all marked. Some of it, if you look at maps, there's a line drawn but real borders, the, the formal borders, you'll see the lines stop and there's nothing. It's because the borders aren't demarked. Why? Because these tribes cross the border. There's nothing to this border. Right. The, the Bedouin I mentioned are the same Bedouin that go all the way down to Mecca. Uh, the Mecca. The Hejaz, they're called Hejaz, the Hejaz is the area. It's the Hejazi tribes. And they're, uh, they're all one entity and they link up with Iraqi tribes. It's, if you control Iraq, Syria, Jordan, the West Bank... Uh, in Iran, you control you. You basically that's it for Saudi Arabia. You're done. Wow. Wow. So All right. Sometimes I, I really encourage people out there. A lot of times, just get a map out because yeah. you know when you hear things are going on, if you look at a map, it becomes much more. Uh, you're much more able to to interpret what's happening. If, if you look at, if you actually, if you just look at a map, don't depend on the Wall Street Journal or the or New York Times to right. tell you what's going on. Look at a map and use your brain because it's a, yeah. because geopolitically it's so obvious what Iran's trying to do. And it is a, and Saudi Arabia gets it. And, you know, and the fact of the matter is uh, Jordan gets it to some extent and it's, and what was put, what Trump put together in terms of the Abraham Accords was essentially a fault, a, a fault line, which Iran would not be able to cross because of the mutual defense. And what we saw the other day, the other day, was that implementation of that fault line, saying, "No, you won't cross this line." And it is a, um, and it means that if there's an attack on Saudi Arabia by Iran that there's going to be Israeli defense of Saudi Arabia, yes, which is right. what Saudi Arabia needs because they got lots of money, but they don't have a lot of people. Well, well the, you know. the UK was involved in this as well. Mm-hmm. How, how strong do we feel that their commitment and is? And where, well, is, they where committed, else? committed, but right. you know, the problem with Europe is militarily, they've been riding on the back of America for 50 years. Yeah. And spending so little that, that they really don't have a great power projection capability. The will was there, but I think we're talking maybe one or two or three, maybe five aircraft. Uh, they just don't have the power to project, and neither does France. Well, so, well that's part of, I, that's the will part was the, there, though. It's part of the, the you know, attrition that's come from Ukraine, where... Uh, Europe, the European countries have discovered that Donald Trump once again was right. They need to start investing in the military. Right. And, you know, that's right. 75 years after uh, World War II, uh, you know, Germany's looking around saying, wait a second, what's going on here? We're we're weak. And very few, so, you, very few European countries until now have spent more than one percent of their GDP on defense. To give you an idea. During the height of the Cold War, the United States was spending 7% of our GDP. And we were one-third, between one-half at the end of World War II to one-third of the world at the end of the Cold War, of the entire GDP of the world. So you can see the enormity of how much we spent compared to Europe. Europe has 400 million people, advanced mm-hmm. economies. If they spent even 2.5%, there would be no contest with Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're not spending 2.5%. And, and that's the tragedy here. Well, to that end, where do we see Russia and 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 even China? I mean, Russia and China have declared their allegiance to Iran. We know that the CCP has played a role in in what Iran has been doing and even potentially a role in what happened on the 7th of October. So, what do we see headed down the road relative to to those two and then my follow-up to that is we mentioned turkey and turkey being i don't know some kind of a quote-unquote intermediary 
But, I mean, the reality is, and David, you and I have talked about this, Turkey's no ally. I mean, no ally and they hate Israel. I think China and Russia, you should separate. China is a tremendous global threat uh, because it is poised to devastate America's position and our allies' position in Asia, in Taiwan, Japan, elsewhere. And this is a global threat that is emerging as great as any as we've faced. Russia, uh, but, but the one good thing about China is it doesn't really have a long history of either maritime power or global projection. So they're putting through their various relationships, they're trying to establish bases in Panama and in, and in Venezuela and so forth, but they, those are pre-positioned uh, sort of uh, places. They don't have the ability to project power and that's a greatly vulnerable structure if there's real war. Uh, Russia is in the same position. They have that structure in place. They have Syria, they have Algeria, they have a couple other places around the world. And like China, they have all this stuff in, 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 uh, in uh, Africa and Latin America. Now they're close also to uh, Lula in uh, Brazil and, and Venezuela and, and Cuba, obviously. The problem they have is, if you look at Syria as a good example, the Israelis have made it very clear to Russia we're very afraid of what you're doing in, Russia, in, in, in in Syria. You can hurt us, but we can destroy the regime upon which your whole position is based, and then you have nothing. So at the end of the day, we have to remember the West does have the upper hand here, that Russia doesn't have carriers, doesn't have 15 carrier battle groups that can park off our shores and launch airstrikes into America. They need Venezuela. They need Syria. They need, they need these countries. And if we, if we strategically can decouple them, that's a devastating blow. So that we are the only nation that has true global power projection capability. And we have to remember that, but we have to cultivate it. I know that and just in the last week, the Biden administration has yet cut yet further the size of our Navy. That is our global power projection capability. We cannot cut the Navy. We should be building it up. Rick? Yeah, well, I agree. It's a, um, um, when I think about what's happening in the world and, and right on our shores, um, 70 years ago, um, I guess 60 years ago, um, John F. Kennedy, uh, said we won't have Russia with missiles in Cuba. And we almost went into nuclear war over it. And now we've allowed there to be Russian and, uh, and Chinese military infrastructure put in Venezuela and put in now in Colombia. On the West Coast, you've got it in Peru. Um, and in Cuba. And, and plus Cuba. And so you have a capacity, and plus China manages the Panama Canal. Um, we lost an election, if I'm not mistaken, in Guatemala, where we had a friendly president who, who lost. Um, you still have Nicaragua being run by the, by the Sandinistas, by Daniel Ortega. That's right. And, you know, and the Mexican government has essentially said, you know, we're, we're a narco-terrorist government. And because... Until because we were dependent upon the United States to put down that problem, you've welcomed it. Mm -hmm. So you've turned our country into a narco terrorist government. Given that, you know, having an aggressive Navy that we can at least take back the Caribbean, okay, we have to take back our pond in the Caribbean yeah. and expand out. The fact that they, they are dominating in the Caribbean and South America as a whole is the biggest danger to us. As, a, as an island continent, essentially. And so we need to do that and then expand out in terms of what we're but doing. This administration has actively been destroying our position in, the, in three short years. They worked against the Colombia government and they had a regime change strategy and they got the pro-American Colombia government to collapse and 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 uh, the narco terrorist was elected they went against bolsonaro in brazil yep. who was a conservative pro american and they got now a communist in the united pro states is going Army. after bukele is going after bukele in um, salvador who's pro western 
harsh on narco-terrorism, cracking down, and we're using the, quote, human rights angle to try to destabilize them and bring them down, which would allow the narco-terrorists to take over there. So we are actively working with our enemies to undermine regimes in Latin America that are aligned with let, us. Let me jump in here real quick and and and, and ask you guys to, to speak to this for a minute, because... You know, I hear the alt-right constantly talk about, and this is one of the things I've talked about, you know, how they, uh, the breaking down of our uh, institutions, if you will, right, which is a communist ploy, and they're using both sides to do it. But you get people on the right that are saying, well, see, you know, America shouldn't be sticking its nose in and shouldn't have anything to do with foreign regimes and all this kind of stuff. And... and and, and as I listen to what you guys are saying, I mean, it would make sense to me. Look, I, I have a five-acre property. For a long time, I didn't have any neighbors on any side. And I had people cutting my fences, coming across into my yard. I had to sit on my back porch with a shotgun at night and fire into the woods in order to scare people off. And then neighbors started to come. And I built relationships with those neighbors. And now I don't have to worry about that anymore. I mean, that just is logical. If you're going to do it as, a, as an individual with homes and properties that you buy here in the friggin' United States, why in God's name wouldn't we think that that would be kind of a smart thing to do on a global level? I don't know. Maybe I'm an idiot, and, but and I think worse, these other people are idiots why would you go, for why, why dumb. Why would you go out undermining your neighbors so that they become your enemies, which then makes every investment and security and and uh expenditure you need to have to protect your land go through this because through david if you say that you're a neocon what a bunch of freaking yeah. morons no, but all, look we do, we don't need to intervene anywhere exactly we need to stop intervening we're intervening on behalf of our enemies we're intervening on behalf of the communist lula to get the conservative Bolsonaro out of office, and we succeeded. We worked against the Chilean regime and got a communist uh, to, to take over in Chile. We work, we're, working, we're working against the Colombian government, which was a great ally, bringing in the narco terrorists. And now we're trying to undermine Bukele in Salvador. I, I, didn't to realize get him out. Had, I didn't realize it would happen in Chile. Chile is a... Um, so we've gone from uh, President Nixon getting a lot of grief for supporting a, the assassination of Allende in Chile, who was a Russia-aligned leader, and we said we cannot have the Pacific coast of South America being dominated by, the Russian, by a Russian-aligned leader, to having actively uh, thrown out the friendly government in Chile that where they had a thriving economy and an economy that we could look at and say, hey, they're trying stuff out. They're like a state and they're trying stuff out that we could then say what works, and what doesn't work from a government policy standpoint. We, we did that. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, and we but we got in this guy who is uh, to the left and we welcomed him and the White House put a great, you know, fanfare of wonder about his election. Same with uh, Lula in in, in, uh, in Brazil. And we're trying to do it elsewhere in the world. I mean, that's what's behind their attack on Netanyahu and the government of Israel. Yep. Is, uh, they're, they're trying to get a pliable, more leftist government there. That's really a Bolshevik attempt at overthrowing the government there. So uh, th this, th this crowd is not playing for our team, essentially, at this point. And I think yeah, others I think are that's being true. It's yeah. stunning, though, that when you once again taking out a map, um, if you look at the map in South in South America and Central America, and you look at the states that are in fact have become uh, anti, you know enemies and and have an antipathy to the United States since Biden became president, who was a foreign policy expert, by the way, according to his bio, <laughs> um, and yeah. you look at the states that have been flipped. And it is scary. We've gone from having Bolivia and Venezuela being a problem to now we have Ecuador, Q, uh, Ecuador, uh, Peru, Chile, Brazil. The only place where there's been a turn anyway in our direction was when the fascists got beat in Argentina 
Um, and we ended up with an Argentinian government that is uh, uh, basically more American than America. That's right. All right. <laughs> We're uh, we're we're at the end of uh, of our time today, gentlemen. Thank you. A lot of great ground covered, and and let me just say, look, on to to the folks on the right that are, that that espouse the whole neocon and military complex and all that. Understand what I'm saying here. We're not talking about going out and getting involved in every conflict and every war all around the globe. Rick is one of the first ones that I know that would say, man, that is that we do not need to be doing that. David, the same way. I don't believe that we do either. But we need to not be engaging in flipping over and turning friends into enemies and when our friends do say to us, hey, you know what? Listen, we're having an issue here. We, we need to create some kind of policy, some kind of bridge that says we're with you because you're a friendly neighbor. That's all. 100%. Yeah, that, 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 I know we're out of time, Greg, but just think about this. The same intelligence agencies that we're worried about what, because what they do politically here are the ones who are flipping these governments from pro-American to anti-American governments. The same exact intelligence agencies working on that's a worldwide right. scale are doing this. And that's why we have to win the battle here domestically to reconfigure those intelligence agencies because without them, we cannot retake this ground. So it is a so we have to get our intelligence agency situation under control. So at least they're going and trying to ex export American interests rather than globalist interests. Well, which yes. which speaks to what you and I were going to talk about. Maybe I can get you to come on later on this week and we can talk a little about it. But the FISA no issue and the FBI issue and what's happening with regards to that, because those are critical pieces of the domestic battle that we find ourselves in that are handicapping us in being able to be in a position where our mindset is the one that is the driving force in America once again. 